Matthew 12. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 12. And this is, the, this is the section right before, when we get to chapter 13, uh, chapter 13 is rather unique in that it is a large section dealing with parables about the kingdom. But in chapter 12, uh, we're going to be looking at Jesus. This is verses uh, 15 and following. But this is Jesus as God's chosen servant. And we've already looked at Jesus as Lord of the Sabbath. And I'm going to see if I can scroll through here a little bit. Because I, what I didn't get to last Sunday was the conclusions that I wanted to draw from this section as Jesus ran into the Pharisees and had this encounter that we went into depth about. Uh, there were some really good conclusions that I want uh, to, to highlight as we move on through the rest of the chapter. The one thing that, that we can't forget is that I believe that one of the strong points that Matthew is trying to create for his readers is to underscore the fact that this quote from Hosea 6.6 6, that has to do with mercy triumphing over judgment was a crucial principle that underlined all of Jesus' ministry. And you're going to see that, and, and I haven't done this in Matthew. In fact, I just thought of it last week as I was, we were touching all this. And man, this would be a great study just to go through Matthew and even all the Gospels if you wanted to. But to look at all of the occasions in Jesus' ministry where he not only extended, but also embodied mercy itself. That would be a neat study just to go through the Gospels and look at Jesus as the embodiment of mercy. What did he say on different occasions? What did he do? How did he treat people? Uh, it seems to me that we have forgotten that part of discipleship. If I truly am a disciple, I have to learn that significant principle in my life, that mercy triumphs over judgment. It's so easy to kick into a judging attitude, isn't it? It's so easy to, to slide into... Um, a view of life that sees people and judges people only by external criteria. And I'm convinced that one of the unique perspectives of the Christian worldview is that we intentionally say that is not how we're going to live. Not by judging people by external criteria. That's not how we're going to live. We're going to live as a disciple of Jesus embodying this whole thing, mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, is that easy to do? <laughs> Probably none of us sitting here would raise their hand and say, you know what, that's been so easy in my life. Oh, it's hard to do. Because we run into situations over and over again that try our patience and our willingness to offer mercy. And we're all aware of that, but that's part of being God's family is we encourage each other. No matter how hard the occasion is to do that, we support and encourage and pray for one another to be able to do it. In other words, I almost feel like in order to offer the kind of mercy that's going to honor Jesus, we need each other supporting each other to be able to do it or even to want to do it. Okay. Um, we talked about Jesus being son of man and the Jewish tradition on that. Uh, talked about the sheep falling into a pit and the values. Uh, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus' ministry pointed out. Interestingly, in a couple of places in the Gospels, it's just a sweeping statement, and I love this. He went about doing good. Um, here's a thought I had on this was, if you've ever gone to the cemetery and you look at epitaphs on people's gravestones, there couldn't be a better one than so-and-so went about doing good in the name of Jesus. They went about doing good. That's a description of Jesus' life and ministry. And, and what was strange about this, and we noted this, 
when the Pharisees and these religious leaders saw Jesus doing good by healing this guy's hand on the Sabbath, instead of rejoicing, uh, we get this mind-blowing observation that from that point onward, they go over here and they start plotting to figure out how to kill Jesus. And there's a part of you that goes, tell me that's not right. <laughs> tell me you're kidding. They did what? They plotted to kill Jesus all because they saw him healing a man's hand. Wow. See, that, that tells you how far removed they were from what the kingdom's all about. And I think that's precisely the effect that Matthew wants his readers and those of us who are reading today as Christians, the effect that he wanted. Look, look at how polar opposites those are. Now, when we looked at this lesson then, here are questions that this lesson raises as we finished last week. Number one, is Phariseeism characterized by pointing out where others are wrong? See, if I point out where you're wrong on something, does that automatically make me a Pharisee? Um, I think it depends on the situation. If, if, I, if that's my go-to uh, sort of operation, mode of operation when I relate to people, that every single time I interact with you, it's to point out where you're wrong about something, then I would say I probably have got the Pharisee attitude. Because I'm not here, it's not my role to constantly point out where you're wrong on stuff. Um, it always amazes me that people think somehow that fosters fellowship among brothers and sisters. <laughs> if I can point out where you're wrong all the time. I don't know where that thinking comes from, but I'll guarantee you it doesn't foster fellowship. It fosters a lot of other stuff, but not fellowship. So, but that is an important question because what it does it raises the issue for each of us to be very careful and self-aware. Am I slipping over into this attitude of always trying to figure out where you're wrong on something? And if so, then I'm, I'm moving away from this kingdom attitude of mercy triumphing over judgment. Number two, and this is a neat question. I'm not sure the answer of it, but are lawful unlawful the only categories available to us when confronted by a moral dilemma. Well, Jesus, in the healing of the hand of the individual, he would say, of course, there's a third category. It's not just lawful or unlawful. And think of how Scripture challenges, uh, and I'm going to say this as a basic statement, and, and we, could, we could go on for weeks filling it out. When you read Scripture, it clearly challenges this black and white thinking. It's either this or that. Scripture is written in the midst of the, how can I say this? In the midst of life experiences that often don't have clear answers. And, and I've come to believe that the reason Scripture is written the way it is, is that God's design is that I come to know Him so well through Scripture that I'm living my life by biblical principles that can be applied in different situations. And I don't know if you've ever done this. Maybe this would be a neat challenge for you. Can you pick out, and I'll just say five, do you know in your own Christian life five basic fundamental biblical principles that are going to always guide you in everything? Have you hammered that out yet in your faith walk? Do you know your faith enough? Do you know your walk with God strongly enough that you can, in discussion, with, yeah, I, I know what the five are. And these will always be principles that guide me in every decision I make. See, we need, we need to be able to do that. What I'm convinced is that new Christians don't know how to do that, and younger adults, maybe who haven't been Christians for a long time, they don't know how to do that. And maybe we who are older Christians need to teach other Christians how to identify and ways in which we can apply those principles. So that, question number two is interesting because Jesus, with his healing the hand uh, of, of the man that had, um, what was the leprosy, he's got this hand that he can't use. In that moment of healing, 
Jesus says there is another category. Number three, Jesus' expression here, haven't you read? I love that. It's an invitation to reexamine a text. And is this approach inherent in following Jesus? I think so. That being a disciple means that every single day I'm going to be digging and digging and digging to reexamine, to find, to discover what it means to follow Jesus. See, we're all, we're all gold miners. I don't know if you know that. God's given you a pick. We're picking away. We're trying to discover in Scripture those golden nuggets that's going to guide us from here to eternity and those wonderful principles that are going to guide every part of our life. And did you know that part of my role as a minister is to help equip you so you can dig on your own? Have you thought about that? That's kind of neat. And, and I'll mention this in, in the sermon for this morning. One of the greatest gifts that Martin Luther left as his legacy is the priesthood of all believers, which meant practically every Christian then had access to Scripture for themselves. Up until Martin Luther's time, the average person really did not have access to Scripture. The only Scripture they ever heard was when they assembled. Um, if they were in Mass, they would hear certain Scriptures. Uh, if they were following any kind of a lectionary through the year, they would hear Scriptures read, but that was it. Didn't have their own copy to study and to pray over and to dig and to discover. I mean, that wasn't part of it. Um, when you think about that, what Martin Luther did was astounding. And when I read about his history, see, on, what was it? On Thanksgiving, or not, uh, Halloween this year. It was the 500th anniversary. Have I got this right? The 500th anniversary of when he nailed the 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Castle. So for the past 500 years, we who are Christians and heirs of the Reformation movement post-Luther, because we're practicing the priesthood of all believers, uh, we, ha we have a twofold responsibility that's fascinating that pre-Martin Luther people didn't have. Because you are a royal priest and we believe and practice the priesthood of all believers, you have access to scripture for your own study, your own interpretation, your own application. But it, it, that can have a downside too because what's happened through the years in the Reformation movement is because everybody thinks, okay, I'm now a priest. Um, we tend to be, if we're not careful, we can be so individualistic in our interpretation and study of scripture that we'll come out on the other side saying, I don't really need you to help me understand scripture. But if you look at the history of the church since its beginning, scripture and its role in the life of the church is appreciated most when it is interpreted individually, but also within the context of community. And let me give you an example, and I'm trying to figure out how to say this without getting in trouble. Are you all ready? <laughs> um, sometimes in my own personal Bible study, I come up with the most harebrained ideas you could imagine. Now, a lot of those I won't say out in the pulpit because I don't think they're helpful. So in my experience in 44 years of preaching is I need you all to help me stay balanced in my Bible study. Does that make sense? And I think that works for all of us. That as, yes, we have individual responsibility to interpret Scripture, but also know that we're interpreting it so that, and here's the so that, not just so that I can understand the passage. That's only half of it. I'm interpreting Scripture so that I can honor God by living in His community called the church. So that ultimately, my goal in reading Scripture is so I can learn how to be the right kind of brother to you. Now think about that. Because I'll guarantee you in the past that's not been our attitude and approach to Scripture. 
our attitude and approach is kind of this Phariseeism thing, number one, that the only reason I'm reading it is so I can prove you wrong. Well, again, the question I raised earlier is, how does that foster fellowship? Well, it doesn't. It creates all kind of controversy. It doesn't build anybody up. So, number three, I think, is really, really crucial because as a disciple, it invites us to investigate all of the time what we say we believe. Jesus says, haven't you read? He's inviting them to look again at a scripture and a story they thought they already knew. So here's something else about a disciple. Inherent in the word disciple is the idea of learner. As a disciple, I never stop learning. I have to have a heart open to learning. New ideas, new principles, new ways of relating, new levels of self-awareness. And I could just keep on going with what we need to keep learning. We'll never stop learning. And, and, and I hope you feel this way, but for me, in my own life as a disciple, that's an exciting dimension of it. Because you're constantly thinking, wow, okay, I learned this today. I wonder what I'm going to learn tomorrow. So I've had to change this today to be more like Jesus, and this is kind of exciting because it's opened up new doors. I wonder what will happen tomorrow. So it's this constant attitude of excitement about the journey and about learning and being willing to change and follow Jesus. You might want to comment on that. Does everybody agree with that? Disagree. <laughs> it's auditorium class, I know, so it's hard to speak up. But I, I, I'm kind of lathering my soap, my bar of soap here because I think this is so crucial and we miss it sometimes. Now, number four is how does the quote from Hosea 6.6 6 guide us today? Very important question. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Jesus even said, go and learn what that means. Go and learn. And what he meant, of course, not just the meaning, you go and learn and figure out how to apply that. What does it mean for mercy to triumph over judgment? Very important question. And, and as I look at my life, how am I doing with that? Uh, does it look like as I'm looking at all the relationships in my life and how I'm treating people that's kind of turned around? Is judgment triumphing over mercy in my life? And if so, why? How did I get so far off base? Number five, as Jesus asked this question, how much more valuable are you than they? How much more valuable? Do we know the true value of things and people and traditions? And do we put it in the proper place? The disciple of Jesus understood and understands the value of things. Traditions have value. Um, we've already seen this a little bit. I am planning on, and I'm trying to remember what chapter. It's going to be after 13, but I think I want to have a whole lesson on the role of tradition in the practice of our faith. Because there is a good part of tradition. Traditions have value. Now you'll notice when Jesus came into his ministry, and he's performing miracles and teaching and doing all this. He doesn't seek to destroy and tear down all traditions. If we read Jesus that way, we misread him. Jesus participated in a lot of Jewish traditions. So I asked I ask a teacher years ago this question. I said, well, what part do traditions play then? And looking at how Jesus handled them in the Gospels, uh, he made sort of a twofold answer that really has helped guide me through the years. Number one, if traditions get in the way of the heart of God and they run over people instead of caring for people, then that tradition is wrong. Number two, for us today, if a particular tradition gets in the way of hiding who Jesus is, and it becomes more important than who Jesus is and what he stood for and how he wants us to become as a disciple, then that tradition is wrong. 
And, and actually the third thing that Jesus, uh, it got him into trouble. Traditions have no salvific value. Traditions are not tied to salvation. You just mark that. That's hard to hear because for many of us, they are. Jesus didn't die for traditions. He died for the kingdom. Now, when we get to the lesson on traditions, we'll see there are some wonderful uh, values to tradition. Then there's some downside to tradition. So we'll, we'll look at that and balance it. And, and I think as you look at the ministry of Jesus, it's pretty clear that he's trying to send a message that on those particular traditions that devalued human beings as the people of God and in, made in the image of God, and it got things turned around where things and the traditions themselves were more valued and became an idol, and it was more important than people. That's where Jesus stood up and challenged it. And that's what got him into trouble. But it was a significant lesson that the Pharisees needed to hear because they were not operating that way. Here's number six. And this question is a tag on to the last comment of this whole section. What is there about religion that causes people to want to kill those who don't agree with them? That just baffles my mind to where I just can't get my mind around that. What is there about religion? And notice I'm just using it in a broad sense so that it covers the history of the religious world. Maybe even and we can think prior to the time of Jesus. But what is there about religion that causes people who want to kill those who don't agree with them. It's just so strange, isn't it? Well, Jesus was a recipient of this. And I think as disciples, what we, what we offer to the world is a different model. Yes, you may not agree with me, but I have to portray the mind of Christ as we disagree. That's hard to do, isn't it? Because usually when there's a disagreement, the other person's always wrong, right? So <laughs> it's never us. It's always the other person that's always wrong. So when the disagreement comes up, how do you portray the mind of Christ? Uh, for some of us, it's easy to get bent out of shape when we disagree, when somebody else disagrees with us. Uh, but that's an ongoing challenge to, to have the mind of Christ even in disagreement. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to me. I don't think it's by mistake. The one time that this expression, having the mind of Christ, occurs is in the book of Philippians. And, and think about this. When you get to chapter 4, uh, there were two ladies in the congregation that couldn't get along. And Paul says, uh, my desire for you, Iodius and Seneca, is you kind of get your act together. That's a good way of translating it. Because unless you have the mind of Christ, that controversy is going to tear up that church. And Paul knew that. So having the mind of Christ is just so crucial when we disagree. Now, this next section is about Jesus being God's chosen servant. One of the neat things that comes up very quickly when you study the Gospels, um, think of how this would be different. If, if we had the picture of Jesus in his public ministry and he didn't know why he was here. Can you imagine what the Gospels would read like? Somebody come up to him and say, um, are you the Messiah? Well, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm doing these weird miracles. I don't even know where that power comes from. And I don't remember much of my younger life. Um, I, I remember where I came from, but I'm doing weird stuff like walking on water. Where did that come from? You know, if, can you imagine how the story of the, of the Gospels would be so different if Jesus didn't know what his mission was? He knew. He knew he was a chosen servant of God, everything that he did. Uh, so if you look at chapter 12, 15 through 21, as it begins this uh, particular passage, the NIV says aware of this. So having known what? What was he aware of? He was aware of the plot 
that was against him. So he withdrew from that place, but a large crowd followed him. It, when, you, when you read through the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels, it's almost like everywhere he goes, there's a large crowd tagging along behind him, and he can't get away from them. Uh, here he tried to withdraw, but a large uh, crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. So he responds with the healing, but notice he warned them not to tell others about him. Historically, this is interesting. In the ministry of Jesus, the, the Gospel of Mark really plays on this. Uh, some have called it the messianic secret in the Gospel of Mark. It crops up in Matthew. There are occasions where Jesus says, I don't want you telling anybody who I am. Now that sounds a little strange to Christian ears, doesn't it? Because as Matthew is going to end in chapter 28 with what we call the Great Commission, the Great Commission is Jesus even tells his disciples, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, this is the opposite of this. And we go, huh? He's telling them and warning them not to tell anybody who he is? Where's that coming from? So it's hard to get our minds around that. But you have to remember at this time in Jesus' ministry, he still conceives of himself as having a lot of ministry to do. And there are so many individuals that have misconceptions about him. And I think Jesus understood that the more the rumors got out and the more the people responded, uh, it, it may have been a deterrent, at least he's thinking, that it might keep him from certain aspects of his ministry. He knew that the time wasn't right for people to hear who he was. And, and here's another thing that fascinates me about Jesus. Even though people misunderstood him, even though they thought they had him uh, put into a preconceived hole, labeled him, and even though he knew all of this was going on, he did not let that keep him from spreading the good news of the kingdom and healing all of the sick and the ill and raising people from the dead. And at the same time, sticking with his disciples and training them. I, I'm, just, I'm just amazed at how Jesus was willing and able to continue his ministry with all of this complete misunderstanding going on around him. Now, you and I would probably have lost patience a long time ago because when we got people around us, we want them to understand what we're doing. We want them to be very supportive and we don't want any naysayers and we certainly don't want rumors going around. So it's as if every single thing that would bother us didn't stop Jesus. He just kept on. He knew he was a chosen servant. He had his ministry and his mission. And no matter how people responded to it, he stayed true to that. Wow, what a great example that is for us. But see, he warned them because he knew that they, the rest of the people uh, by, at large were not really to accept him for who he was. Now notice, and we're going to barely have time to get into this, uh, this passage is a lengthy quote from verses 18 down through 21. Jesus recognized, and this is very significant to the way Matthew portrays the ministry of Jesus. It was to fulfill that which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And we've already seen, starting way back in his early life and in his early ministry, there are constant references to the prophets. This was done that it might be fulfilled. Now, there are two reasons for that quotation or that way of introducing the quotations. Number one, early Christianity... Uh, and even during Jesus' time in his ministry, uh, had to labor against the idea that they were bringing in something so new that it didn't have any uh, root in the past. Uh, this is why in the Gospels so much is tied to the Old Testament. Because the early church was faced with people saying, well, you're just the new kid on the block. This is something new. Why should we believe you? And the early preachers and disciples and the writers of the Gospels laid the foundation and said, this isn't something new. This is why 
you have such wonderful statements like in the first chapter of Ephesians. From before time began, God predestined that those who would be chosen would be in his son. So from before the creation of the world, and, and you're going to see a couple of times Paul will use that expression. He's tying it into the eternal plan of God. This isn't something that just kind of popped up. It's been from the very beginning in God's plan. And so this fulfillment passage from Isaiah chapter 42 is Jesus' recognition that he was chosen by God to be his servant. Now here's another thing that we've talked a little bit about and we haven't developed in the, in the fullest extent and we probably wouldn't have time in this studies through Matthew to do this. Since Jesus sees himself as a chosen servant of God and, and think about as Christians when we're chosen by God Think about as Christians when we understand our identity as servant. I wonder if we went back through the Gospel of Matthew, what does a chosen servant do? What does that kind of lifestyle look like? How do you think? How do you relate to people? How do you see your personal ministry? How do you see yourself? So this whole notion of chosen servant not only describes Jesus, but also every one of his disciples. Thank you all for being here, and we'll pick up next week.